Well, the reason really that we're here, the reason I've come, was because of OIC and because of Howard Jones. Yeah. Let's face it, I, uh, I'm trying to cut back on my travel uh, as much as I can. And uh, I was talking to Grace. Grace, my wife, was supposed to attend with us. But it happened that Hope jumped up and had another baby. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Grace was with Hope and the baby. And, uh, but uh, all is well. But we love Howard Young. That's why I'm here. I don't get around much anymore. But we love Howard Jones and that's why we're here. To let him know that not only is he one of my adopted son, but he's a, he's a great leader in the OIC movement. And that's why we have come. There are so many people I can thank. I, I want to thank his wife, of course, more than anything else out there. Who stands with him and who helps him, who writes the checks and all that kind of thing. I'm <laughs> And I want to thank you and Wilson for the leadership you've given to help this movement go on. Bob Kirk, I want to thank you for the chairmanship you provided. So the way you stood there and helped travel all over the country to help keep the OIC movement ahead. And, 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 I, and Mary, I want to thank you for letting Bob run around like that. <laughs> I know it's not easy because he jumped up all the time. So I'm going to see Leon someplace. Oh, I see it. I guess you get tired of hearing that stuff. But he's doing a wonderful work and helping a lot of people. And I want to thank you. Again. But uh, Howard Jones, he's the, he's the star tonight. Uh, not Leon Sullivan. Howard Jones. And his family to come up with that moving tribute. And I'm glad that it was captured because that's something that will never be forgotten. We thank uh, Eva, Clayton, Mr. Clayton for coming, the, your congressperson. Uh, you should know that whenever in Washington we call on Congress people to meet us, to encourage us, and to let them know that they're supporting us, there's always one congressperson we can count on, and that's this young lady here. So persons make promises and say they're going to show up, but somehow at the last minute they send an assistant. But even that send an assistant, she gets there to encourage us. She's the one person I can always count on standing with and behind OIC, and I'm just so proud of you, and I want your people to know here. These are people who, these are your voters. You know that you're doing your job, girl. <laughs> now, uh, I'll just give me a few more minutes because I know how late it is. I'm here, my presence here, I hope, says something. But I, this is a historic time. You know, no one knew where Wilson, North Carolina was, with those of you who lived in Wilson a few years ago. <laughs> and Wilson, you knew about it, and this part of North Carolina you knew about Wilson, but we didn't know anything about Wilson, North Carolina. The only thing I knew about Wilson was, was that I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> No, I didn't know, I thought maybe that's where they made Wilson football or something. Uh, but Howard Jones came by, and now everybody knows about Wilson. Jones. Wilson, North Carolina is now on the map of America, the map of the world. It's wonderful to hear these great statements from the auditor and from the White House and from Brother Lee and all of you who see the influence of one man on the life of so many people. If somebody said, it's extraordinary, it's a miracle, it's the work of God what has happened here. 
the last 27 years with this man. When he told us he was coming to Wilson, as I said, we wondered where in the world he was going to. <laughs> but he came because God sent him. And he is living a he is leaving a legacy yes, he is. that will affect not only North Carolina, but that will affect this country and affect the world. Jesus didn't have a whole lot of people. He only had a few. And most of them were all messed up. leaving a mark here that will never be erased in the history of this state, certainly in the history of Wilson. I'm pleased today when they drove me up, Howard Jones, what is it? Court. And I saw all those houses, the Howard Jones Court. I will move around, there's even a golf course nearby. <laughs> I was so pleased to be here with the Howard Jones Scholarship Fund. That's leaving something behind. And you know, it didn't all just happen. We're not all here because it just happened. Because this man has made a mark for himself, and we're all here to say thank you. Really, it's a thank you meeting as much as anything else. Today, I saw something that is absolutely unbelievable and remarkable in America. Not a government program, but a non-government private program at a little place called Wilson, North Carolina. And I saw 4,000 people waiting in line to come and get food. They've been standing some of them there since 5 o'clock in the morning. They're all colors, they're all kinds. I saw them in wheelchairs all ages. Because this man, Wilson OIC, is doing what Jesus said. You're feeding the hungry. You're clothing the naked. And that's what Jesus said. I don't know the place in the United States where what I saw today can be seen anywhere else. And everyone I saw, they'd been waiting out there for several hours. And I didn't see any frowns. But I walked up, they smiled, they sure didn't know who I was. But they were nice to me, how do you do? <laughs> <laughs> waiting in line two, three hours for food. And I understand it happened regularly. They didn't put on that show just for me. There's something that's been going on. And A&P is to commend it. But I'll repeat A&P. Buy something from A&P. <laughs> for sending that food like that on a regular basis. And Wilson OIC for the way you help it. I went to a warehouse. And there were cars and trucks lined up from churches with ministers and deacons and trustees and pastors collecting food out of the warehouse, putting that truck so they can take it to the church to be distributed to the families and the children in those churches. So it wasn't only what I saw with those standing in line today, it's the thousands of people, the tens of thousands, who will be fed and who will be affected and helped through this program that I saw today. It is a remarkable program. I haven't seen anything like it in the United States. And I come to tell you that God is blessing you in a wonderful way and through Howard Jones, you're blessing thousands. You're doing the work of the Lord. And that's the work of OIC. It's wonderful. I saw the staff today. I went into the rooms where they're working on HIV AIDS. I think it was mentioned here. HIV AIDS is still in America. And it's still a problem we have to grapple with. But here in Wilson, you are ahead of the curve. And 
doing things that have to be done all over this country. And I saw people being helped, and I saw, and, and, and I saw how they carry the the, the, the the hospital care out with mobile units, so the people out on the hills, the dales, and the poorest communities can receive treatment and help. That's the work of the Lord. You're helping people. If I can help somebody, then my living will not be in vain. And so, Howard, that's what you are doing. And Sylvia, that's what you are helping Howard to do. And all of you of the Great OIC movement, that's what you are helping each other to do. You're doing a great and wonderful thing. I don't know of many OICs in the world doing more to help people than you are here at Wilson, North Carolina. Who would have thought it? Wilson, North Carolina. <laughs> Becoming a movement of the world that people are getting to know about all over the world. OIC, as been intimated, was started in an old abandoned jailhouse. It started with nothing. But from that old jailhouse, OIC now has, has moved throughout the world. We, we're all over this country. We've trained more than two million people with jobs. In Africa, we've trained a quarter of a million Africans with jobs. We, the largest OIC in the world is in Poland, where every day we train 4,000 people a day. And the program has grown so that now the former social, Soviet republics, OIC committees are being formed. OICs are in the Philippines, they're in Latin America, they're all over the world. They're in England, they're all over the world. From an old abandoned jailhouse, that's what God can do. And I'll tell you, if you trust in God, you can do anything. Never limit God. Trust God. Now what makes the OIC so successful? Well, why does it spread so? First, because of the spirit of OIC and because of the kind of leadership we have. As long as you have somebody like Howard Jones leading a program like this, it's going to continue to flourish. I heard these politicians, and politicians are prone to be so complimentary of some people doing programs like this. But you heard them one after the other and after another talking about what this man and what this program has meant to this community. And it's the spirit of the OIC and it's the leadership of OIC that makes it successful. Howard Jones, you were all a miracle here. God has used you in a wonderful way and we're so proud of you. You don't have to worry about getting into heaven. Your seat is already ready. You don't worry about getting that seat in no. But God's proud of you. OIC is in the business of helping people. We help people with attitudes. People who have had poor esteem of themselves, poor opinions of themselves. We teach people self-pride. We teach people there's somebody and that they go on from there. And I've seen this in that film as I've moved through your city. People who have said to me, this program has helped me to find myself. It's given me confidence, self-pride. It's given me something to live for. You heard it on the screen. We're proud of you for doing that. Teach people skills. 20 years from now, three-fourths of the jobs that we do in America won't exist. New jobs will have taken their places. The changes in the world are happening so fast, job creation, different directions so fast, that it, the mind is boggled, when you imagine. As a member of the Board of General Motors, 1971. Each year I travel to the technical centers of General Motors to see what innovations we have in automobiles and in communications and transportation. And every year I'm amazed at what's coming along. Some of you will be seeing a new Cadillac soon. that looks look like it's getting ready to fly. <laughs> They're making smart cars. The day you have brakes that you use with your feet. In time, you'll use brakes with your fingers. You'll have the, uh, the drive of an automobile will look like he's sitting in a cockpit. Mm -hmm. Everything will be digital. Today, the biggest carrier of computers is an automobile. More computers than your automobile than any other place except those satellites going to the moon. Because all of our, all of our cars will 
be operating by computer. And if you're not able to read and write and count, even do a little computer, when you now you won't be able to drive a car. Today, when you go to state police and they test you on signs, if you use them now, they're going to test you on something else, on finger dexterity, on your ability to work buttons and so that you can drive an automobile and not wreck the car or run into something. I've often said, and it's, it's coming true, I told you a few years ago, the day will come when automobiles uh, will run on uh, electronic beams. We're already doing it in California. We already have entire highways that we're putting electronic beams on. So automobiles can be set on electronic beams and run without you even having to drive an automobile. They will come, I've said, when you get in your car, you're going to say go from here to New York on I-95, you set your car in New York, push your button on a computer, you go to sleep. When your car gets to New York, <laughs> ring a bell, take the seat and turn it off. so fast, it's hard for you to even see them. And what I'm talking to you now about your own motors, what we're doing is only a little part of what lies ahead. Every large institution and business in the world is a Now how in the world are we going to help people get a job when they can't read, and they can't write, and they can't spell? Right now, you can get along with it. You get along with it for a few more years. But you can't get people to be self-sufficient in jobs that count unless they'll be trained. And OIC is the only program I know in America that has lasted since the poverty program. That has lasted. That will be here to help these young people to get skills, to get jobs, the new millennium. That's why your OIC is so important to you now in Wilson and in Philadelphia and in Saginaw and in Phoenix and in Indianapolis and where all of you come from, Calabrese, out there where you are. Because without the OICs, this country, for people who are at the lower scale, not the higher scale, at the lower scale, are going to be in trouble. Welfare is coming to an end as we know it. In the next two years, welfare checks as we know it will stop. They're already beginning to stop. The benefits we get from welfare at 2001, 2002 will not exist anymore. We gotta find new ways of reaching people to train them so they can be self-supporting. Any individual or anything that depends on something else for its survival will not last long. If you have to depend on welfare or handouts or somebody else for what you have, if you move it from you, you will fall. But if you have something that will help sustain you with education and skills and confidence and the ability to help yourself and help your family like an OIC, you will stand. Yeah. It's something like this OIC nationwide. We're going to keep on going anyway. As long as the Tommy Hopper, we're going to keep on going anyway in Alabama. Nothing's going to close us down. But if you want America to be benefited for the future, when welfare reform as we know it is done, and millions of people be thrown off in order to find a job without the skill to do almost anything, this country is going to be in trouble. And I warn you, I warn America, that we only have two or three years to get this thing together. Or else we're going to have problems again in our streets and our jails will be full. We'll have to continue to build jails. Because if you can't get a job at work, you're going to steal. If a man and a family is going to find a way to get food for his family somehow, even if he's been to church and baptized, he'll do things that he didn't dream that.
thing we'll do when it comes to a point that he has to do what the hell his family will do. So you need something like an OIC. Yes! We are a private program. This program was not started by the United States government. It was started by a black creature from West Virginia by the name of Leon Sullivan. <laughs> God, Amen. to help God's people. Amen. We don't get anything for it. I don't even take a sour out and think I'm going to do something for it. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't taken I won't get into it. <laughs> I'm in this because it's God's work. I'm a preacher. I'm a black Baptist preacher. And this is God's work. Thank you. <laughs> Stand by your OIC because the challenges are great and you are doing God's work. And those of you who are in the OIC business, stay with it. And I ask the government to then take this appointment. North Carolina, Brother Lee, don't let anything happen to this program. And if any money comes through those appropriations, be sure we get our part of it. <laughs> it's there. We want our piece of the pie. Because this OIC is good for Wilson and North Carolina and it's good for America. Let people stand on it. Let me put this thing down. <laughs> the great challenges that are ahead. Challenges ahead in affirmative action. In our states, more and more affirmative action is being cut off. That means that African Americans and blacks who are despair and others will not have the advantages for jobs they had before because of affirmative action, but we have to do something to be sure those doors are open and to be sure these young men and these young women get opportunities that have been denied them and many instances are still being denied them. So we cannot be quiet or silent how these laws are made that cut opportunities from under the feet of young black and Indians and Hispanic youth, we are, and, we, we, and we're not going to stand for it. And something's going to happen to change it around a little bit. November the 2nd, this is the first time I've made this public announcement, but you'll be reading about it. November the 2nd, Kofi Annan of the United Nations and I at the United Nations will be uh, making an announcement of global Sullivan principles of corporate responsibility for America and for the world. <laughs> and the same thing we did to change South Africa and to free Mandela. Now those same principles are going to be applied to America. They're going to be applied, Brother Campbell, to where your brother is in Atlanta. I just talked to his office today. They're going to be applied in California. They're going to be applied in Pennsylvania. They're going to be applied in Mississippi and Alabama. And they're going to be applied in North Carolina and Wilson. Global Sullivan principles that require that companies train and give equal opportunities to everyone and move them up the scale of opportunity. Principles that require companies to help with HIV AIDS containment, to help with schools and clinics and housing, and housing, to help with the quality of life in communities, to see that a portion of their profits go not just to the bank for themselves, but to go to help the needs of the common people. Yeah. This is happening in June the second, June the second. It's going to go. It's not only in America. It's going to Bangladesh. It's going to Beijing, and it's going to, it's going around the world. It's going to make a difference in the lives of millions in the world because we're not going to stand by and see opportunities halted, halted for our people. Brother Robert, you'll be hearing about it. Your chairman's already a letters on the way. German Motors, I am German Motors, a letters on the way. A new day, new challenge. Then you have a new challenge in this community. 
because of the mighty hurricane. <laughs> you just can't let it float. Floyd has been by. Wrecked your communities, torn down your houses, inundated your communities. But you just can't pray and ask God to help it. You got to help yourself. And God will help you. I'm proud to hear that this congresswoman has said that help is coming. But with help coming, you and your communities must help yourself. Today, preachers were in a room. We decided to help with the reconstruction of housing and the rebuilding of communities and the establishment of businesses so there be jobs for people. You'll hear more about it. But I'll tell you, help is on the way and we're not going to stand still in North Carolina. Are we, Wilson? To see that we're going to do something about it. The blood king taking an opportunity to rebuild your communities that were already falling down. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Challenges for the future of OIC are great. But you are ready for it. Not only is this program helping in America, but you should know you are helping in the world. In Africa, Wilson, North Carolina is better known in Ghana and in Abidjan and Senegal than the big cities of America. You know why? At the summit meetings we just held, the biggest contingent and delegation from America came from Wilson, North Carolina. And from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You're helping home. You're helping America. You're helping the world. We started a people program, a people's fund for Africa. The Jews help Israel. The Irish help Ireland. The Poles help Poland. Now blacks go help Ireland. 800 people have pledged to five-year promissory notes, 6% interest, to help a thousand businesses to get started in Africa. Do you know what city has more pledges for African business to get started than any other in America outside of Philadelphia, Wilson, North Carolina? I commend you. I congratulate you. Not only for what you're doing at home, but what you're doing abroad. You are a great program of hope. Wilson, North Carolina. Standing high on the totem pole of world recognition. You're making a way and a way that the world has not seen the lights of before in helping people to help themselves. And so I congratulate you, government. I congratulate you, Wilson. I congratulate you, the people, for what you're doing. I ask you to continue to work together. And it does not yet appear what you shall be. Don't let anything stop you on a mission. Keep doing your work. Help Howard. And those who are leading this great program and walk together. And don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. God bless you.